it for Vladi as he shares a story. Come on, baby. Thank you, church. Thank you. Uh, this is awesome. This is good stuff. Uh, so uh, I want to thank you, Brendan, uh, for allowing me to share my story, my testimony, our family's testimony. Uh, 30 years ago, my family stepped off the uh, plane coming from Russia as refugees with $100 per person and two suitcases. Basically, my family left everything. Same thing for my wife's family. Uh, 30 years ago, in August it will be 30 years for us, we landed in Atlanta. So uh, while I'm sharing my testimony, I want to make sure I come across uh, properly that uh, I'm not boasting of what happened to us and how it happened, but I'm telling you, this is a good country to be in. <laughs> and it's, it's very appropriate for 4th of July to say that this is the greatest country. It's still the greatest. So for those of you who complain, stop complaining. <laughs> Just go and visit other country and see how good it is here, okay? So anyways, um, we know our humble beginnings. My wife grew up in the village where she had to go to the restroom outside. They didn't have the restroom and the running water in their house. So this is very humbling to be here and speak to you guys and share with you what God did in our life. So I want to share a couple of uh, moments in our life. And I would call them the hardest moments, the toughest moments. And uh, while I'm sharing that, there's two, two guys that got highlighted in my, in my, in my mind from the Bible. Judah and Peter. They both committed the same sin. They both did what? They denied Jesus. Okay? What happened to the one? And what happened to the other? So God, as a good father, will allow us as his children to go through the valley. To go through the valley of Baca. And he's so faithful to give us sweet waters in that valley. He will allow, and he's, he will actually orchestrate the famine in our life so we can train the muscle. Pastor Brandon is going to share with you a good, good story about the famine. I mean, famines are always constant in the Bible, and they have not finished today. We will see the famine. What we do before the famine and in the famine is determining who we really are. And a very good asset test for us Christians is living in faith, no fear. What I want to share today is about the seed and the bread. I've been doing financial planning for the last 17 years, and I've seen Christians, God's children, eating bread like crazy, stuffing themselves up, living in debt, eating everything, no seed. The hardest people for me to deal with in my office is the people, Christian people. Who, when I start talking about tithing, they're the ones who are against it. I'm being honest here, guys. They're the ones knowing the Bible, quoting the Bible at me saying, well, that's an Old Testament. So anyways, when I was 18, God, I got saved. <laughs> and God opened my eyes that I need to be faithful in tithing. And I have been faithful in tithing for, the rest, for, for most of my Christian life. And then 2008 comes, we're in a prosperous, very good position. My, I, I was a youth pastor in the church. We had over 300 kids. That, I mean, the, the church is took off from 70 members to like 1,000 members. Uh, my wife Mila was a worship pastor in the church. Life is good. Uh, we are investing in properties. Everything is beautiful. We're, we're doing great. And 2008 comes. You know the rest. Famine started, we lost everything. So 2008, 2009, 2010 was the toughest years of our lives. We're going through bankruptcy, ch file chapter 7. We walked away from the community that we were in. Um, we were pretty much on our own. One Sunday night we woke up and we're like, do we go to Lake Tahoe or do we go to church? Well, the church won. And we ended up here, actually. First Sunday, 
And the guy who was holding the microphone was talking about his book, Church Wounds. And I tell you, that service was for us. We bought the book, read the book. Uh, Father's Day came. Uh, there was a lot of signs from God that he's like, Vlad, this is your spot. This is, your, this, this is where you need to be right now because I want to heal you. Pastor Bob came around, a bunch of men who some of you are in this house, and it just started. It was hell. It was tough. But we were at the right place. Fast forwarding a little bit, uh, God started doing something. I realized that if I solve small problems, I'm going to get paid little. If I solve big problems, I'm going to get paid a lot. So I just, you know, rolled my sleeves and I started helping people. Getting rid of debt, getting rid of credit cards, helping them doing mortgage uh, modifications, all that stuff. And the income started coming in. And we're like, whoa, this is good. And I'm like, I, you, I don't know, Bob, if you remember that, I'm like, is this temporary? Is, this is good. I like it. Is, is this temporary? And it just kept doubling. I mean, it's still going. And I'm like, this is interesting. But the main thing God started teaching me is, is about stewardship. I'm like, God, what's the lesson you want to teach me in 2010? I mean, I remember the time where we had a women's group in our home, and the, the, the men came in and shut off our electricity because I couldn't pay the bill. And I remember my daughter came from school. <laughs> she got her piggy bank, and she's like, Dad, can, can, can you pay the bill? Are we, how are we going to wash our hands? I mean, I mean how are we going to do all of this stuff? That was tough. And I'm like, God, what, what is the lesson you're trying to teach me here? I don't want to go through this anymore. I want to learn. And he started talking to me about stewardship. He's like, are you going to eat through all the seeds and, and move them into bread? Are you really going to eat that? So I'm like, I need to save, and I need to pay my tithe, and I need to live too, right? Guys, I'm telling you, the acid test comes in every time you get a paycheck. You're going to look at that paycheck, whatever it is. I don't care. It's 100%. Are you going to eat through it? Or are you going to save a little? Are you going to tithe? That asset can take. And I've learned that the more faithful I am, the more God can give us. If I cannot be faithful with $5,000 a month, I don't care how much faith you have. You will never get $10,000 a month. So I came to a realization, the reason why there's not many wealthy Christian people, because our Father is so good. He will not allow anything and anyone to destroy your life. That's why we're broke many times. He will provide. No, no, yeah, you're laughing, but it's true. We're broke because, because we eat through everything. The biggest test, Proverbs says that, this is not Vlad's words. The biggest test for a man is his success. Success can destroy us easily. I ask, I ask this question all the time in my office. If God would give you a million bucks, what would you do with it? And pastor, very rarely I hear 10%. But I'm waiting for that. Are they going to say 10%? If they say no 10% given to God, I'm like, you, you're, you're in for a ride. It's going to take a while. Before you see that, well, anyways, let me come back to my testimony. I wrote a lot, okay? <laughs> and I got to run. <laughs> so, 2010, that's what God was teaching us. Are we faithful with little? Are we going to give? Are we going to save? Then another test comes. Um, 2016, July, actually, three years ago. We're in the mountains with boys. I love riding mountain bike, and I fall. And I break my hip. I'm like, man. And I'm in business. I mean, I don't get paid if I don't show up, right? Uh, so then my dad calls me and says, come over. We got to do my will because I don't feel good. And uh, they found cancer. So I'm on crutches. I'm, I'm, I'm in pain. And my dad is dying. I can't help him. 
So I'm in, in my truck uh, driving home, and I know he's going. I mean, that cancer ate him up really, really fast, like in three months, and he was pretty much gone. We started begging God to take him. I'm like, God, either heal him or take him. I mean, he, again, don't feel sorry for him or me. He was 90, okay? So he had a good, good life, okay? <laughs> so I'm like, and it hit me. I'm driving back home in the car. It hit me. I'm going to be an orphan. And I had that little pity party in my truck. I'm like, God, I'm going to be an orphan. My mom is gone. My dad is dying. And I tell you guys, it just came me. It just came. He's like, Vlad, I have fathered you. You're not an orphan. I'm like, so I'm not adopted? <laughs> so, I mean, guys, if you know me and, and my life, I got saved when I was 18. I did a lot of bad, bad stuff before I got 18. I couldn't even receive the gift of the Holy Spirit because I thought God will never forgive me. I thought I'm the worst. I thought I'm the, I'm, I'm like, am I even, so anyways. And he's telling me in my truck, I fathered you. I'm like, oh, this is good stuff. I can do anything I want. I am fathered. I, I'm not just chosen or, or I am fathered by God for a purpose. I'm like, oh, this is good. So that t the tough year went by. I'm good. I'm everything. And then I'm here, somewhere third row right here. This is actually the most anointed place right here. <laughs> so I'm just saying. After worship, Fred is here, so he knows the story. Fred comes in after worship and says, Blood, uh, God laid on my heart that uh, he sees you as a kite. And uh, the storm is coming. I'm like, Fred, you're missing the point, man. Okay, continue. And the God says, the string is secured. I'm like, this is interesting. Okay, fine. I'm like, Fred, but 2016 is gone. I'm still carrying the weight of my leg, being shorter, about nine, nine, nine millimeters from the fall. My father is that, what bad can happen to me? I'm okay. And then 2017, I'm making a decision to walk away from uh, $10,000 of residual income. I worked for a captive company. Whatever I made in my 15 years of work, they're like, we'll take it from you. It's ours. We'll take your clients. We'll take everything. But I feel like God is telling me, Vlad, you need to step out in faith and do it. I'm like, really? <laughs> so, uh, yeah. We created new partnerships, started on our own. And I tell you, God is so, so faithful. And uh, we haven't seen a down year yet. I know it's probably coming, and I don't really care. <laughs> if it comes, he's preparing me for something bigger. Yeah. I feel like God is training us, you know, to develop those mu muscles of faith, muscles of trust in him. You know, what we are doing in the valley of Baca, what we are doing in those times of famine, really determine, determines who we are. And I know that biggest thirsts are coming. I mean... Uh, the, the, the more God gives us, the more weight I feel. Uh, I'm like, I want to be a good steward. I want to be faithful, you know? It's like, God, did you, like, do sh are you sure you're you, you talking to the right person? I know where I came from in Ukraine. My dad had to take us out from school to go help out during the harvest season to prepare for the winter. I mean, I know what I've done in my life. I'm like, God, are you really picking the right man for the job? So right now what God is working on me is really be faithful in what he gives me. And he gives us a lot. I don't want to say how much. It doesn't really matter. My 100%, your 100%. He's looking for faithful servants. Not just servants, slaves' minds. He's looking for stewards. There's a lot of young people in this room. Guys, if he's giving you a thousand bucks a month, that's a lot. He wants to see what are you doing with that a thousand. Are you eating through it and getting into debt, getting into, into credit card debt? Money. I mean, it was the biggest battle for me. Do I still be a pastor or do I go and deal with money? A lot of churches think money is dirty. No, money is a good acid test who you are. It brings out who the person is really is. I mean, 
think of it. Just, just start thinking about that million dollars. If we don't know what to do with a million dollars, God will never give us that million dollars. That's a good asset test right there. So I want to finish off on uh, this Romans chapter 8. I love Romans chapter 8. Read that chapter in, in, in Message Bible. Paul goes saying about this, 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 and then he says, with us, Romans chapter 8, with us, verse 30, if you're going to look it up, but read the whole chapter, please. Romans chapter 8, 30, he says, with God on our side like this, how can we lose? If God fathered me, how can I lose? I don't care what, what kind of famine comes. Most God's people prosper during the famine. We're out of this world. We're not, we, are, we live in this world, but we're not of this world. We should be prospering during the times of famine. But God wants to see how are we preparing for that. Are we going to keep whining? Are we going to lick our wounds and have our pity parties? Or are we going to rise up and say, Father, I know who you are. I love that story about, I'm preaching right now, am I? I'm done, okay. <laughs> Altar call time. Let's stand up. I want Vlad to pray for us. And Mila, Mila, can you come as well? Where's Mila at? Stay standing, stay standing. Come on, come on down front. Uh, you know, again, uh, and I'll say it a few more times in the message. This is not one of those tithing trick testimonies. I hate it. I hate it when you're at a church and you're like, oh, this is one of them tithing ploys. No, this is not a 10% issue. This is a 100% issue, as Vladi said. All of it's the Lord's, and he's watching all of it. He's looking, and again, as I've seen a life, and Bob can attest to this, they've been through ups and downs and struggles and just seen faithfulness and resiliency. And, you know, what I love about Vlad is I said, hey, can you come and teach financial stewardship to some 18-year-olds? Now, with who Vladi meets with, that would seem like a step down for a lot of people. And he's like, I, no, has absolutely. So he spent a year with a bunch of discipleship students that I was with, and trained them in finances, they had more in their savings account than all their parents. And I had one, I had one kid come to me, he's like, yeah, can you, um, I'm, I'm not allowed to tell my parents how much money I have in the bank anymore because it makes them feel guilty. See, there, there is a way to look at what God gives us, and, and I love my friend and, and what he's done and his faithfulness and, and how kingdom-minded he is. So again, let, let that be the deposit this morning. Just let's close our, close our eyes this morning. You've been in that place of need. Uh, not just talking about just need provision, but you see, you know what? I feel like this stewardship subject has been something God's been speaking to you. Just lift your hand up right now. Father, we just pray for grace to respond with stewardship. I'm going to have Vladi and Mila pray. Uh, Father, we thank you for who you are, that you're such a good father who loves his children so much. Father, we, we just want to be good stewards. We just want to be faithful. Lord, I pray for those who are in their hard times, famine. I pray that you would help them to make the right choices and right decisions in the valley of Baca so they can find that sweet water, that they can dig up those wells and put their roots deep in you, knowing who you are and who they are in you. Lord, I pray for those who are being tested by success right now during this good economy. Help us to be faithful, Lord, during the good times so we don't turn the whole income into, into bread and not eat, it, eat through it, but that we would prepare for the good times of famine to be wealthy like Jacob, like your, your people, the ones that you were with, in covenant were with. I pray that we would pass our tests good. With every paycheck we get, Lord, help us to be faithful. We pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. Come on, give it up for Vladi and Mila. Love them. All right. We could end now, but we're not. So, <laughs> um, no, we do feel, as, as Vlad and I were praying, um, you know, obviously we'll prepare, and God laid a passage on my heart, 
And then I was ready to go. I'm like, oh, this thing preaches itself. And then uh, the Lord just did a little rewire on Friday night. And I really felt like we needed to hit this subject of famine because it's something that we need to wrestle through. In good times, we have to wrestle through it. In hard times, we have to wrestle through it. Um, Jason, is, is the whole band here? Do they leave? Okay. Okay. If, if some of them could come, that'd be great at the end, FYI. Sorry, a little, little combo. I can't text in the middle of my message. So, um, I mean, I really feel like we need to, to get a mindset that the Lord wants to rewire in us. You know, we are renewed by the mind, it says in Romans chapter 12, and not be conformed to this world, but be transformed. For the renewal of the mind, a lot of us have this, these scarcity mindsets where we just live with a mindset of struggle and striving when we have to understand that self-sufficiency is not the answer. God is our sufficiency. He's the one that provides. And so, uh, and that being said, I, I really feel we're supposed to break some of that power in our mindset that we fall and pray to. Um, so let's open up our Bibles to so Psalm chapter 37, verse 18 and 19. I'll say some verses that will be familiar today. You may have heard and, and some that may be new, but really feel like we need to rewire and ask the Lord for a transformation of how we think of his provision in times of hardships. Psalm 37, verse 18 and 19, and then we will pray. And then I have to go catch a plane. So it says this, The Lord knows the days of the blameless. Psalm 37, 18 and 19. The Lord knows the days of the blameless, and their heritage will abide forever. They are not put to shame in evil times, and in the days of famine they have abundance. Let's pray. Father, we just thank you for your goodness. Lord, we thank you for the testimony that... Vlad and his family have shared where they trusted you. Not once did I talk to Vlad in those hardship seasons and he was bitter or angry towards you, but he chose to trust. This morning, we thank you that you are extending a hand of trust to this community. You're asking us, do we trust you? Will we remain faithful in the midst of hardship, in the midst of struggle? Will we call you our sufficiency? So Holy Spirit, we just pray this morning that just the religiousness that comes, maybe when we talk about resources or money, just with eyes closed, you see, you know what? I have a bad taste in my mouth from what's been shared to me in the past at a church. Just lift your hand up if that's you. Father, we just pray for healing in the hearts of those that have been wounded by the abuses in churches, the religious spirits that come in. When they hear about resources and finances, they get really uneasy. God, we thank you this is not about finances. This is about our life, how we steward our life, how we're faithful in our life. And Holy Spirit, we just pray that we can have a mindset and knows that you're the God of not just enough, but more than enough. You're the God is faithful. You help us in the middle of our messes. You're not a, a, a cruel father that leaves us on our own and abandons us when we fail. But Lord, you are faithful even in the midst of our failure. So Holy Spirit, would you come this morning and speak to us through your word in Jesus' name. Everybody said amen. To the person next to you, wake up just a little bit. It's midday already, for goodness sake. You probably still have that rib cook-off hangover right now. I can feel it. I can feel it. How many can remember the greatest meal they've ever had? You ever have those times when you think back of those great things? We talked a little bit last week. There are people that like food and people that love food. How many of those food lovers out there with me today? I love food. I love food. And and as a child, do you remember your birthday when you would pick your favorite restaurant? But as you get older, things progress. Remember that first favorite restaurant? It's like, I cannot wait to go to the Sizzler. I want that Sizzler. And you'd watch the commercials, and it was kids' buffet. I want that Sizzler buffet. But then you eventually outgrow that buffet. You eventually no longer are age-qualified or back then, believe it or not. They had scales that kids would step on. I know. This is a different time frame. You can never do that. You can never do that today. My brother had to step on the scale. I'm like, nope, you don't qualify for the buffet. I'm like, okay. I swear to you, not kidding. Madison Avenue. There you go. We grew up in the hood, baby. Anyways, I know. Trust me. As an obese child, it was a tough little conversation to have. We could go a whole other direction right now. Let's stay back. The Sizzler Buffet. And then you graduated to the hometown buffet. I remember that. 
and you go to hometown and you'd fill up your plate. But uh, that love with hometown buffet didn't last long because then we took out my grandfather to hometown buffet. That was also his favorite place. And he decided to take out his dentures and set them in front of his plate. And he would mix all of his food together, including the dessert, the jello and mashed potatoes. And as you watch a man gum his food, I'm good. I'm good. And when you outgrew Hometown Buffet, Shrimp Fest at Red Lobster. Those Cheddar Bay Biscuits. Just eating those things, you're like, let's just take communion right now. The Lord is in this yeasted roll. The Lord is here. Bottomless biscuits. Yes, thank you, Morgan. Thank you, Morgan. We'll make them vegan one day, I promise you, Morgan. But, but as you grow older, then, you, then you, your taste becomes a little bit more boutique. You know, you go to some fine dining restaurants. Well, about 15 years ago, I went to, on a missions trip to Peru. And when you go to a, a third world, you just are told you eat what is before you. You eat what is before you, and we ate some really wild things on that trip. But the, the, the missions leader said, we're going to take you to a nice restaurant. And you're like, we're in a third world country. Like, what, what does that even mean? So we all had these expectations. So we come down to get into the van. They said, no, you have to dress up. So we had to borrow jackets. You know, it was one of those things. You're like, where are we going? So we walk in this place. This giant gate opens. There's like this chateau in the middle of Peru. And as we get there, they have this open dining area outside. There is fire pits open, this long table, and your backdrop is backlit Inca ruins in the back of this restaurant. You go into the bathroom, you have a waiter in the bathroom with a towel, and they go and show you the urinals that they've filled with ice. I don't know what <laughs> world this is, but this was a big thing. They're like, ice. <laughs> All right, we're peeing on ice today. Because so what we're doing. <laughs> Sorry. Just truth. Straight. Keep you straight. So we go and we sit down and they bring out this menu. It's in English. And we're there. And, and I, again, I'm overseas, so I want to order something I could never order here. So you're looking through and you know it's going to be nice. It's a very expensive restaurant. And as we're there, you know, all my friends order this Argentinian steaks. And I'm like, listen, I can get steak in America. What's something I can't get today? And the, and the guy points. I'm like, what can I not get in America? He's like, this. It was a gourmet guinea pig. So they bring out this, <laughs> this gourmet guinea pig that was uh, just near overseas, right? But my friends are like, these, this, it was literally the best steak of their life. It was so good, they wouldn't even share a little bit with me. I'm stuck with this guinea pig platter, you know? Like, that's what I have. Well, anyway, amazing night. Best meal of everyone's life except for me. And next year, we're all excited to go to this restaurant. You know, I mean, exchange rate's incredible. Uh, averaged about $30 a person, uh, which, again, there would just be exorbitant. So as we're there, we say, hey, we're going to go back. So we all save up. We're going to go out for this, you know, this, this meal. We give all the money to our missions leader. Well, he invites all of our translators and the impoverished pastors. So any pastors that we've been with on the trip, so he invites us to this dinner, same thing, giant table, waiter in the bathroom, ice in the urinal. I mean, it is the same experience. Uh, as we're there, I, I know Argentinian steak is the way to go. One guy next to me orders two of them. I mean, it's an incredible meal, the best meal of my life. Well, the waiter goes and brings the bill to our missions leader, and he gets it. And then I see him take his thumb and his index finger, and he starts pinching the bridge of his nose. I'm like, oh, man, he's got a migraine. I hope he's okay. So as I watch him go like this, he then puts his head in his hands. I'm like, that's not a good moment. So I walk over. I'm like, what's wrong, man? He's like, how much money do you have? I said, what do you mean? He said, I left. Whoa, we just got the Holy Spirit's here right now. <laughs> Lord, Lord's showing up. Let's turn this down just a tad. <laughs> He says, uh, how much money do you have? I'm still, Jesus has just showed up on the stage. Glory to the Lord. The angel's on high. There we go. Um, <laughs> hello, those that are online right now and have no idea what we're talking about. The lights just got really bright. Um, comes over and he says, hey, I, I left all the money at the mission space. And 
you can't just tell this restaurant guy, hey, we'll be right back an hour away. You know, it doesn't work that way. So I go to all the missions leaders that we're there with. We scrounge up what we can. We're still short. We have to borrow money from the impoverished pastors and translators. It was the worst moment of all of our lives. And they're just, they're just so like, because again, in that culture, it's an honor culture. They just don't understand what's happening. They don't know if, like, it's a joke or it, it was just, it was the cringiest meal. So, like, the greatest meal to the cringiest moment you can imagine. Then we get back to the base. We're having to repay these pastors and they're trying to refuse payment. It was just awful. It was just an awful moment. How many have ever been in those times when what, what you plan does not come to pass? Have you ever been those times when you've set up a party and you don't have enough food? Or you've gone on a vacation and you didn't plan enough money? But how many are grateful that we serve a God that when he's at a wedding, when you run out of wine, he's faithful to provide? How many are grateful that we serve a God that when you go out for a Bible study on a mountainside and you're hungry, he says, give me some fish and we'll make a feast. This is the God we serve. See, for us, we love when people don't prepare and get what's coming for them. How many are grateful we are not God? I'm grateful you are not God. I'll tell you that right now. You ever been in those moments where you see someone, like, not plan well? And you're like, should have prepared better. You know those moments? You've been, like, hiking with somebody, and you have, like, your little trail mix, and they're hungry. You're like, oh, well. Should have got another cliff bar. See, but when we're in that spot, all we want is grace. When we're in that spot, we're just hoping that somebody can be generous for us, and we serve a God whose grace is sufficient in your weakness. We serve a God that in the midst of hardship, in the midst of struggle, is still faithful to provide and to be your sufficiency. He's just asking that you allow him to be so. Will we allow God to actually be our provider? In our mindset, in our, in our broken American culture, we love the phrase that God is our co-pilot. See, when we say yes to Jesus in the modern culture, it's this get out of hell free card is what we really want. We really hope, like, okay, if I say this prayer, you mean I won't go to hell? Yes. Okay, you say the prayer. And then we don't change our behavior. And then we kind of use Jesus as this sin-free slot machine and, and hope that we don't die on the wrong day so we can say the prayer before we die. That's not, that's not what God's intended with the context of salvation. Salvation means freedom from those things that hold you. Freedom from those things that make you captive. See, Jesus doesn't want to be your co-pilot. He doesn't want to be that annoying partner in the car seat that's trying to bark out directions. We've all had those people we've sat with. Just be quiet. Just be quiet. Jesus isn't designed to be your co-pilot. Jesus is your king. He wants to be boss. He wants to be in charge. And will he allow you to share your thoughts and opinions? Yes. Does it mean that what you want to happen is going to happen? No. Because guess what? Your thoughts, they're not his. Your ways ain't his ways. But will you trust him in the journey? What we have in this context of famine, we have to understand where famine came from. We have Genesis 1, which is this garden teeming with life, teeming with fruit, teeming with veg vegetation. It is an amazing place, but what happens? There's this tree of life on the inside in which you eat of it, you live forever. Adam and Eve break covenant. They defile the garden. We studied this a few weeks ago. The first temple is the garden. And really the original sin is when Adam allows the serpent to enter the garden. That's the original sin. That you were not allowed to have anything defile it come in. And he allows the snake to attend the garden and to be in the garden. And then he allows it to tempt them and to twist God's words. Now, what should have happened, Adam and Eve should have died. It should have been done. But God covers their nakedness. The first sacrifice is given. He provides covering for their shame, but he has to remove them from the place of provision. 
And as that cherubim is placed there, they're now going to have the hardship and toil of dry ground. And we notice this theme in Genesis that famine is now part of the fabric of the fall. Famine is almost in every story of the patriarchs. In Genesis 12, what provokes Abraham's faith is he's in a season of famine. Abraham's big journey, that prayer time that he saw the vision was because of famine. He's in the middle of a famine. Shortly afterwards, Genesis 26, Isaac, his son, is in a famine. Shortly after that, we then have Israel, who was formerly Jacob, in famine. It's a part of society. Famine was a regular occurrence. As we studied with a Hebrew scholar, she said that three out of every five years in a Palestinian country at that time frame was in severe drought and famine. It was regular. It was a common occurrence. And what you would do is if you worked the farm, you worked every day of the year. There were no days off. Bill Belichick would have loved that. There were no days off at all. You worked all the time. And God makes this covenant with Israel, sends them out of Egypt. They're in the desert. They're in the wilderness. He meets them on a mountain. And he gives them two very strange commands in the midst of the other. First command is this, Exodus 31, 13. You yourself are to speak to the Israelites. You shall keep my Sabbath, for this is a sign between me and you throughout the generations. Given in order that you may know that I am the Lord and I'm the one that sanctifies you. Here's the thing. Days off didn't exist until Sabbath came. Days off didn't happen. So part of their witnessing tool to the world of God's faithfulness to Israel amongst the nations was taking a day off. Because in the outside world, they would look and say, you guys are crazy. And they would watch them and they would wait for their crops to die and yet their crops are more fruitful than theirs. See, what, how is this possible? Because Yahweh has made a covenant with his people. Yahweh is faithful in famine. God is faithful in the midst of famine. But here's what's unique about Sabbath compared to our weekends. See, what we did in the modern Western world is we took Sabbath plus one day because the Christians celebrated the Sunday. So we said, why not two instead of one? See, a lot of us, we take these weekends. But have you ever noticed you're more exhausted after the weekend than before you got there? Uh, friends go on vacation, travel the world, and they come back more exhausted than when they left. And they're dragging themselves into work. See, what's unique about our weekends and the Sabbath is that God was a part of the Sabbath. See, Sabbaths were the sanctify. They invited God in the process of their rest. And for a lot of us, when it's time for vacation... We'll say the center prayer afterwards. See, God is rarely a part of our recreation. That word recreation means recreation. God wants to recreate you in those times of rest, but we have to make him a part of it. And I'd ask you the next time you're on vacation, the next time you have a weekend, ask God how he wants to celebrate it with you. I guarantee a lot of your behaviors would probably require less repentance after them if God's a part of it. Moderation would be included in that. Guess what? God likes to have fun. I think he invented that thing called joy. It says that Jesus had the oil of gladness. He was the most joyful person in human history. He's not this mad God in a corner hoping that your life is terrible. But he wants you to have genuine joy, not the false joy that the culture offers today. Because there is a restlessness in the soul of society that only Jesus can fulfill. So he commands them a Sabbath. The next thing he commands them to do, in Leviticus 23, verse 1 and 2, it says, The Lord spoke to Moses, saying to them, Speak to the people of Israel and say to them, There are appointed festivals of the Lord that you shall proclaim. Holy feasts unto me. So he commands them to feast. Now for us, we celebrate Thanksgiving. Many of us never celebrate Thanksgiving in true need. 
Again, we've been delivering groceries to the neighborhood for now 10 years, nearly 10 years, and making Thanksgiving meals. There are many families, but for many of us, there, there's not really a need. We eat feasts. But here's what we have to understand. Feasts in that time, in the midst of famine, required faith. A feast was never easy. It wasn't something you do. If you're in famine, you don't empty the storehouse. When you're in famine, you don't kill the fatted calf because you need it when it's lean. And the Lord says, will you trust me? Will you lay it all on the altar and trust me that I'm your provider and you're not your own? I am faithful in famine. And what they would do is they would celebrate, they would worship together. God would be a part of this feast. And they would lay it on the altar. And what it did was it allowed those that were in severe famine to actually eat. Without the feast, they believed that Israel would have died because of the severity of the famine. It actually gave their tribe nutrition in the midst of survive famine that would surely follow. That those feasts were so nutrient-dense for them, it sustained them to the next feast, and their tribe continued to grow. See, God has commanded feasting for our benefit. That's why community is essential. No one is called to feast alone. No one is called to eat an amazing meal on your own. You've ever made a great meal for yourself? And you get about halfway through, you're like, this kind of sucks. You start creating conversation in your head. Just me? Yes, probably just me. No one is designed to feast alone. See, I really believe that modern gluttony is just feast deprivation. We're learning to feast in secret. We feast in secret. We consume these things. Because when you actually are feasting with community, there's moderation. Moderation happens. People tell you to not get a second plate. We all talked about it. Last week we talked about these mom moderators. They're really good. Others haven't eaten yet. No seconds. One portion. We all know those people. You may be that person. But feasts are essential for the community of faith. And they had faith was required in the midst of famine. So as they have this take place, we find that these seasons of difficulty continue. But what we tend to do is this. When we're in a difficult season, we think that it's God's disapproval over our life. When we're in difficulty, we think God's obviously mad at us. When difficulty in a biblical worldview is not because of God's disapproval. It's for your development. Difficulty is about development. It's about becoming the person that God is grooming you to be, making you to be. Job is one of the hardest books to read in all the Bible. Brutal book. Tragedy. But some of the sweetest promises you will find are in the book of Job. Job chapter 5, verse 20. In famine he will redeem you from death, and in war from the power of the sword. See, Job's there having this argument with God, and God declares his faithfulness in famine. Job's in the worst season of life, and God says, I'm going to redeem you. You're not going to die. See, difficulties for our development. We find famine used quite a few times in different books. The one next to Genesis is the Psalms. Psalms is actually third on the list for most usages of famine. And see, here's what we have to understand. We've all had those worship songs that resonate with you. You ever have those old school worship songs? You're like, yes, I'm going to sing this song. It's like, oh, they knew exactly what I needed today. They sang about famine a lot. See, Psalms, we read them in a modern context. They sang them. And they would sing about famine. Famine was the hit of a Sunday morning back then. Be like, yes, they're singing about famine again. God is good in famine. Psalm 37 Verse 18, the Lord knows the days of the blameless. The heritage will abide forever. They are put to shame. They're not put to shame in evil times. In the days of famine, they have abundance. They would declare God's abundance in the midst of famine, and they would sing it. They would sing it and declare it, even though they didn't have it, because they knew that God was faithful in the midst of famine. But a lot of us, when we hit seasons of difficulty, we try to pray our ways out of it. And what we tend to do, especially in a culture that believes that God speaks, we try to go find prophetic words that are contrary to the season that we're in. 
You ever done that before? I really need a word. I really need a word. They say the same thing that God's been speaking to you in your quiet time. He's like, no, wrong word. Go to the next person. Go to the next person. Because we're hoping for these words. Because we've been sold a false, false gospel in the modern church. This prosperity gospel. See, the Bible talks about prosperity. It's appropriate provision. But this luxurious, opulent life that your faith is expressed by how many cars you have and how big your house is, that's a broken theology. It's broken. It's wrong. It's sick. See, we, we have this pain-free prosperity gospel is what we love to teach. But guess what? All those first century believers, they went through tremendous difficulty. But they lived like they were in seasons of great provision. Because they knew there was a food they had not eaten that the world could not provide, that only Jesus could satisfy within them. They lived for something greater. They lived for something else. So the, even the nation of Israel started to seek prophetic words to get them out of difficulty because we never want to hear that God's actually working on us and making us go through hard seasons where God lifts his hand so hardship comes. So what do they do? The number one place you find the word famine in all the Bible, believe it or not, second place is Genesis, third is Psalms. Number one, Jeremiah. The book of Jeremiah talks about famine the most in the entire Bible. Why? Because God's trying to get Israel's attention as they're worshiping other gods. And he sends famine. And they get mad. And they don't change their behavior. They continue to worship these other gods because they would sacrifice to these gods in hope of rain. In the hope of provision, the hope of harvest. So they go to prophets in Israel that served at the temple. And this is what they say. Jeremiah chapter 5 verse 11. For the house of Israel and the house of Judah have been utterly faithless to me. They have spoken falsely of the Lord and have said, He will do nothing. No evil will come upon us. We shall not see sword or famine. They declare false promises. Jeremiah 14, 15. Therefore, thus says the Lord concerning the prophets who prophesy my name, though I did not send them. And you say, sword and famine shall not come on this land. By sword and famine, those prophets are going to be consumed. It's harsh. See, God doesn't desire these things to happen, but he does it to produce holiness inside of us. Now, we have modern words to describe these Hebrew words. Now, when we look at Greek and Hebrew, Greek is a very complex language. Hebrew is a little bit more, I mean, again, it's sophisticated, but it's just a little different. Not as many vowels, not as many letters in the Hebrew, Hebrew language. So when they would read this, it reads differently than how we would read it. We have a modern word called famine, and we hear of famine, we think of drought, we don't think of rain. But the word famine is literally translated hunger. God will send hunger on the land. Think about it that way. See, I believe we live in prosperity as a nation, but there is hunger in the land. We are, we are hungry, and we're trying to consume all we can, but it will not satisfy. It will not meet the need. Only Jesus can bring rest to the soul, Matthew 11. The entire nation is starving in their soul. And they're trying to feast on pornography. They're trying to feast on these wild excursions. It will not satisfy. When you see someone on Instagram with a smile on their face and their great day, best life now, it's not real. It's not. I hate it when I'm at a coffee shop or at the mall and you see about 11 different selfie retakes. Have you seen those? That perfect selfie you see was probably a hundred retakes. Can you help me? No, no, my eye twitched on that one. My eye twitched on the one. Okay. One, two. It's the worst. It's so fake. But when we see it, we can't see through the fake. We think it's real. It's wrong. It's not real. There's a starving soul there. It's longing for the affirmation of a thousand people that will not satisfy them. They're longing for it. And what we tend to do is we try to pray away the pain. We try to pray away the seasons of difficulty. When God says, I've sent hunger that you might seek me. And here's the other word, sword. Now, again, in this context, it is talking about Babylon. It is talking about war. So when I say this, don't be like, well, actually. 
The word sword is translated a few different ways. It either means dagger, sword, dagger, knife, or chisel. I want us to just play with this for a little bit. See, God sends hunger in our life, but he also uses chisels in our life. You ever seen a chisel? And it literally means the chisel in the hand of a stonemason. Somebody who knows tools is like, that's actually a flathead screwdriver. That's not a chisel. Yes, I know that. It's what we had available upstairs. So, see, God uses a chisel in our life to make us look like him. We're being renewed in his image and likeness. You've been conformed to the image of Christ, as it says in Romans. But guess what? Have you ever seen a chisel on, on stone? The power of a hand is not sufficient. See, a chisel requires a hammer. See, a chisel requires more pressure and leverage. And what God does for transformation in your life is he brings hunger and his hammer to make you look like him. And it hurts. But here, as I was praying about this morning, chisel, it's, it's, it's in the hand of the stonemason. Here's the deal. We've all seen amazing pieces of art before. You've been to a nice place, you see those paintings, and, and they're there, and they're like, shh, don't talk. Like the art, like the art can hear you, right? Shh, don't talk. Like a whisper, no, no pictures, please. What? Why no pictures? Because the light. Because the what? The light, the light will shine on it. <laughs> and you're there and you're like, my cell phone doesn't even give light off of it. See, artwork is delicate. But I was just praying this morning. You see a statue made of stone, made of marble. See, statues can withstand storms. I don't know if you heard me. Statues can withstand storms. See, a lot of us really want Jesus to be so delicate with our life, and please don't hurt me, God. And See, he wants to form you into his image and likeness, and he's a good dad. He's kind. He's patient. He's loving. But he wants you to look like him so that you're not easily moved. He wants you to withstand storms. Ezekiel 36 gives this great promise. He says this. He says, behold, I will give you a new heart. We all like this verse. A new heart, a new way to think. Yes, Jesus. But he says this. I will remove your heart of stone. Guess what? You ever try to take stone out of the ground? It's hard. See, a lot of us want this magic wand altar call. Yes, Jesus, I'm new. I'm totally different. Sometimes, but then you're angry tomorrow because the heart of stone has to get chiseled out. And God takes that hammer and he pounds it and he chisels it and he's making a new heart within you. But it takes time. And often those seasons are when there's hunger, when there's famine. He says, will you trust me in the season of pain? Will you trust me in the season of difficulty? It takes faith to get through a famine. And a lot of us here are just hoping. We're, we're just praying, God, just give me resources. Give me resources. Give me resources. Listen, God says, what are you doing with what you have? What are you doing with what you have? And it doesn't mean because someone's really prosperous, they're really stewarding well. They could be squandering their family. With the totality of your life, with your intellectual capital, with your hands, with your family, with your heart, are you stewarding it well? I met some incredibly wealthy people in my life. They are not good people. I met some amazingly wealthy people that you think would live like paupers. You see them, and you go to their house, you're like, oh my goodness, this is a nice house. No, one family lived off 10% of their income, gave 90% away. Lived incredibly well. But they said, we are trusting God with everything. Will we trust him with what he's given us? I'm going to invite up Jason and the team. I want us to sing together real quick before we go. Final story. Uh, in the, 
mid-1800s, 1835, a man named George Mueller. Here's a picture of George. Got that picture of George? George Mueller and his wife have this house. He's a, a pastor at the time and a businessman. And he sees all these orphans on the street. And they're just orphans, no parents around. They've just abandoned these kids. Different, you know, sicknesses would happen, and a kid would just end up on the, on the street. So he feels God speaking to him. He renovates his house, and he opens it up for six orphan girls. Word spreads out. Doesn't know what to do. Renovates the house again. Now there's 30 kids living in this house, he and his wife. And as they're there, the neighbors start to complain of the noise and the stress on the utilities. That's the neighbor's complaint. They're too loud. And all the pipes aren't working because of those kids. So George prays. God sends him to a different place. Gets another property. God provides for it. Now has 300 orphans in the house that he's caring for with his wife. And so caring for these kids. This is a well-documented story. I, this is, I, I've looked at this several times. One morning, they're there. Now George was told by the Lord to never ask for money. God would be his provider. So he was never allowed, every church he spoke at, he was never allowed to ask for the needs. He would simply pray. God said, you pray and I'll provide. <laughs> so, one morning, they go, wife comes, there's no food in the kitchen for 300 children. And they're ready to eat, and they're sitting down. George makes them sit at the table in faith as if there's a meal. He says, there's nothing there. He says, we're going to thank God for the food. Thank God as he finishes the prayer, the door knocks. The Lord spoke to the baker, and he made them 300 loaves of bread. They're eating bread. They get another knock on the door. It's the milkman. He says, hey, my cart has broken in front of your house. This milk is going to spoil. Can I give it to you? George later on would continue this life of radical faith. And here's what just this humble couple did. They cared for 10,024 orphans during their lifetime. Established 117 schools which offered Christian education to more than 120,000 orphans. Not receiving payment or support only accepting unsolicited gifts, this organization received and dispersed 1,381,000 pounds. 90 million pounds today, if you were to translate it. By the time Mueller's death, they distributed about 285,000 Bibles, 1.5 million New Testaments, and 250,000 other devotional type books. Here's one unbelievable quote. This is, I love this story so much. It says this. He wrote this in his journal. A brother in the Lord came to me this morning. And after a few minutes of conversation, he gave me 2,000 pounds for furnishing the new orphan house. Now I'm able to meet all the needs for the expenses. In all probability, I will even have several hundred pounds more than I need. The Lord not only gives as much as, as absolutely necessary for his work, but he gives abundantly. This blessing filled me with inexplicable delight. He had given me the full answer to my thousands of hours of prayer during the past 1,195 days. 2,000 pounds, 1,000 days of prayer. There's no sense of, why haven't you done this for me yet, God? He's joyful when it comes because we serve a God that is faithful in the famine. He's faithful in the difficulty. And he's faithful to you today. Let's stand together as we pray. Father, we just thank you so much for your kindness. Let me just invite the prayer team forward. For those that are here today and they're in a tough season, Lord, I pray that we would not resist the hammer. I pray that we would not resist the season of hunger. But, Lord, you would be the one that would satisfy our needs. God, that your hunger right now in this season, the Lord says, this hunger is not just meant for striving, but he wants to fulfill you. 
But Lord, help us to seek you in every area of life. Lord, we pray for the disillusionment. We pray for the hurt that we've experienced, that, God, you would come and bring supernatural healing. And this morning, you would show them your grace. You would show them your faithfulness. So the eyes closed. You've been that season where you see, you know what, today, God spoke something significant about what my life and stewardship is supposed to look like. Just lift your hand up if that's you. Father, we pray for the ability to respond to the word that you are speaking, that you are faithful and you will answer, you will provide in those times of difficulty, in those times of seeming despair. You are the one that is with us. So Holy Spirit, would you come and meet this community in a radical way, in the name and the authority of Jesus Christ. Everybody said Amen, amen. If you need prayer for anything today, just please come forward. Prayer for healing, help, or if anything we spoke on today, we'd love to pray for you. Again, thank you so much. Have an amazing Sunday.